Although there's a lot of doom and gloom um, around Varroa, and without doubt a lot of work and learning to come for us, my mind is more about optimism and opportunity. Um, and I think if you're at this conference, um, you share at least some of that optimism for the future. Um, with investment in research ever increasing and advances in technology like RNA tech, um, treatments, I believe the future of our industry, even with Varroa, is bright. Um, I'll start by apologising to any Greeks in the room um, for my mispronunciation of any Greek names throughout this next 15 minutes or so. Um, I've been to Greece many times over the last 15 years and have seen many improvements in their management of Varroa and economic value um, of their honey industry. Uh, my most recent trip alongside my wife was in October last year. Just working. Oh, the big one. There we go. Uh, my wife is Greek, which is handy, given my lack of English speaking skills, let alone Greek. Uh, this is a beautiful town of Meteora in um, northwestern mountains of Greece. Um, it's home to 24 monasteries, which were established um, nearly 400 years ago. Uh, 12 of which conti continue to operate today, including their apiaries, um, which they use for pollination and honey production, as you can see, their little honey jars they sell. Oops, shit, sorry. Um, in Greek mythology, bees were supposed to be the messengers of gods and honey a source of wisdom and poetry. Honey is long, has a long and storied um, history in Greek, Greek culture with references dating back to ancient times. Um, here you can see some clay beehives found in Crete, which is an island off mainland Greece, um, dating back to 1400 BC. So that makes our um, short bit of history pretty damn short. Um, the photo to the left is the Omphalus stone um, at a place called Delphi. Um, it's adorned in bees, as you can see. It was placed some 3,000 years ago and said to symbolise the navel or the centre of the earth. Um, just a few things. Greek has the highest domestic honey consumption in the European Union um, at 1.6 kilograms per person per year, which is double that of Australia. So we're talking about, um, like, you know, um, Steve Taggart's spoken about it, AgriFutures has spoken about imported honey. There's a bit of a lesson there for us in regards to our own marketing within consumption um, of our own honey in my mind anyway. Um, Greek, Greek honey is marketed very well and it's of high value. Um, they get roughly four euros um, per kilo, bulk unpacked. So it's about seven bucks. Um, what are we at the moment? About four something. Uh, so why Greece? Um, Greece has had Varroa since the 1970s. Some of the Greeks tell me 74 and some say 76. Um, as far as I can tell, it came in through Turkey in 74 and Germany through the north in 76, already with deformed wing virus from day one. So something to think about how lucky we are in some ways. Um, Greek has a Mediterranean climate, um, very similar to Victoria. Uh, has long hot summers, arid dry areas, winter snow-capped mountains and temperate um, humid coastal zones and microclimates um, with everything in between. It has vast forested and natural areas um, which harbour more than 1.5 million registered commercial beehives. And you've got to remember this is Greece, so they're not overly compliant when it comes to registration, so you can probably double that. Um, so between 1.5 and 3 million red, um, beehives in a country that's the size of Victoria. So do, do the math. Um, uh, they have a second highest density of beehives in the world next to Hungary. So it's about 11.5 beehives per square kilometre. They're literally everywhere. You don't, you don't have to um, organise a, an apiary visit. You just drive and pull over. They're everywhere. Um, Greek beekeepers are educated. They're highly adaptable and they're experienced. And the last reason to go to Greece is... Um, why not? I could think of worse places to go on a study tour. If there's any accountants in this room... Um, <laughs> there we go. 
Uh, there are three predominant strains of um, honeybee used in Greece, the German Buckfast, uh, the native Cecropia strain and the Carnolian. All three locally are very hygienic, largely Varroa tolerant through genetic selection. Um, and as you can see in the top right photo, um, SMR and VSH traits are quite obvious. Um, this is from a test hive for potential breeder, breeder stock. Uh, it hadn't been treated all season, so um, when I went it was like mid-autumn, so yeah. Uh, I visited um, three beekeepers over the month of October. Um, the first one, this is Lazarus. Um, he's a beekeeper from the Manny Peninsula. He manages around 350 hives in an area known as the Peloponnese um, in southern Greece. And he's one of very few beekeepers in Greece to do AI insemination. So that's where that photo of the, um, the uncapping, recapping behaviour came from his breeder. Uh, Lazarus produces thyme, wildflower, acacia, citrus, fir and pine honey. Um, the last two being honey juice. Um, I think someone spoke earlier about pine honey. Uh, and Lazarus has always treated um, organically. He hasn't had much choice um, being new to the game. Um, so this is uh, Yelcha and George. Um, they're from the beautiful, I'll try this word, Agrinio, <laughs> I'm not very Greek, so region um, in the central west of Greece. Yalta and her father own Technoset B. Um, those who know me know I use Technoset beehives. Uh, George and his father own a retail beehive supply store and they also manage around 1,500 beehives. And Yalta and George are standing in front of and inside there um, with their newly completed purpose-built extraction and honey packing facility um, that they've just built in order to market the majority of the time, pine, fir, oak, cotton and citrus honey which they produce. Uh, and finally, oh, I'm going to give this one go. Uh, this is Yorigo and Yani. Um, we'll just call them George and John for the sake of <laughs> easy. <laughs> um, George and John manage uh, about 2,500 um, hives. So this is probably in the large end of the commercial numbers. You've got to remember, we're not seeing any loaders or pallets here, are we? So... Um, which is pretty hard work. Um, they migrate their hives all over mainland Greece throughout the whole season. They produce all of the previously mentioned honeys um, and they also do pollination um, of the huge stone fruit industry and the small almond crop which exists in Greece. Uh, they do about 20,000 tonne of almond, I think, not much, but um, these guys make a little dollar out of it. So, um, Interestingly here... Um, uh, they have year-round brood, these guys, so they're running brood 365 days of the year. They follow the sun right around Greece all year. Um, so right here, I spent the whole day with them preparing bees um, for winter pine flows um, and removing amatrose strips, um, and it's in the northwest area known as Helkadiki, Macedonia, um, so it's right over, over there. <laughs> okay. Um, IPM, this is, this is it, it's funny, um, listening to John and Matt, um, it's all similar message, it's just a different time period, I think. Um, so Greece experienced 50 to 60% losses annually up until the late 90s, um, from Varroa, obviously, um, due to limited treatment options, overuse of what was available, and a little understanding of IPM. Um, Varroa had resistance to fluvalinate, apistan, I think, we, is that right? Fluvalinate, apistan, um, in the early 90s. Um, Kumafos shortly after, and everything else in between. Um, Amitraz is the only synthetic treatment that's still working, and that's entirely, I think I wrote mostly, but it's entirely through to improved IPM strategies. Um, Greece now has under 10% losses from Varroa and Varroa-related viruses. Uh, the biggest take out of their IPM is they monitor, and I think Matt's mentioned it, and John, these guys, they know 
they know intimately what's going on inside their hives all the time in regards to mites and virus loads. Um, they have a strong focus on viral loads and their pathways within a colony. And they have a deep understanding of chemical residues and their synergistic toxicity to bees. I think we're all going to probably learn that in the future with miticides. Um, their cultural controls include varroa tolerant stock, which I've touched on before. They do forward, uh, forced brood breaks with cages, like this one. Um, so anyone with a, I don't know, under 100 hives could probably do this commercially, I suppose. Anyone with more than that is pretty hard going. Um, but they'll put a queen in here for 18 days. And then on, on day 25, um, they'll, they'll sublimate exolic acid because there's no cat brood. Um, really big um, might kill, but you're losing 18 days worth of brood, so everything has a win-loss. Um, so that's that one. And now force me notes. Um, sorry. Um, and they do, and, and then they have these splitting techniques. Um, one, one's really good, um, which they do in the spring. Um, so they keep the queen in their donor, um, in the donor hive, and they remove all of the cat brood, and I mean all of it. Um, and they place it into a nuke and add a cell. They then treat the donor hive um, by sublimating exolic acid. Um, and then the nuke after 14 days, resulting in high mite loads for very little cost. Um, I'm not endorsing exolic acid, just reporting, okay? Um, <laughs> um, so that's one method. And they maintain um, very high quality nutrition to aid um, immune systems against viral pressure. Uh, their chemical controls, well, they're 95% organic. Um, and it's not through choice. They've only got one synthetic option. So um, as much as um, I hear people, not here, but, you know, as time's gone on, complain we don't have enough options, just keep in mind that every option we have works. So, yeah, we're lucky in some ways. Um, so they're 95% organic. They do year-round exolic acid strips, um, uh, in the spring, they use formic acid flash treatments, um, both like formic pro and liquid. Everything's pretty, pretty off label. <laughs> um, uh, those flash treatments kill parasitised bees, along with um, inferior queens. Um, and then they install um, uh, queen cells in every hive after treatment. So that's their requeening strategy. Um, they use amitraz or thymol in late summer, early autumn, and they time that with drone production stopping. The theory being um, they kill the mite load and therefore the viral load or remove it um, before the majority of the mites go from the drone population within the hive to the worker bees, therefore keeping the viral load lower on those bees that are producing their winter, um, winter bees. So that's what it's all about. Um, the things I've learnt, the first three to five years of local varroa, varroa incursion here is going to be challenging while feral colonies persist. Uh, development of varroa tolerant stock is paramount to a sustainable industry with varroa. So to me, um, we might not see the impact of, of, of starting um, breeding programs now, but the next generation will. Um, sooner that gets started, no matter what. Um, yeah, it needs to get started, in my mind. Um, you need, we're going to need to know a local environment inside the hive and out at any given time throughout the season intimately, along with um, varroa biology. We can just, just learn about the enemy. Uh, and monitor, 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 always, as the others have said. Um, and we need to make the most of the low viral period. Um, hopefully it stays like that forever, but... Um, we need to make the most of it and create specific, sustainable and flexible IPM strategies. And rotate your treatments. I mean, everyone's getting drilled about that, but rotate your treatments so we don't end up like these guys. Um, gain an understanding of viral loads, their pathways and effects within the hive at any time. And finally, um, Greece now has more managed beehives than it ever did before Varroa. So the message here is those that, um, those that persist will prosper. So that's it. Thanks.